Would you be seated this morning and grab hold of your Bible? And would you take and turn with me to the book of Acts? We're going to be in the New Testament book of Acts chapter 4 today. We're returning to our series through the book of Acts. We've had a few weeks off for various reasons. We had Dr. Queen here last week, who, by the way, just really was shucking some corn up here. Um, he <laughs> shucked it right down to the cob, okay? <laughs> so... Um, wonderful, wonderful time having Dr. Queen here. Grateful for him. And, uh, and as you know, before that, for a couple of weeks, we had illnesses sweeping through the office. And so <laughs> we just had a few weeks that have been abnormal around here. But we're going to be back in our series through the book of Acts today, chapter 4. And we'll be looking at verses 23 uh, all the way down through 31 there in that text, okay? And uh, just by way of reminder as to where we are in this book as we are going to, to read the text here in just a moment... Uh, Peter and John have at this point seen Christ crucified and resurrected. They have watched him along with the other disciples ascend to the right hand of the Father and commission them to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them all that Jesus had commanded them. And, uh, and so they've set out to do just that. And they've seen thousands and thousands of people come to faith in Christ there at First Baptist Church of Jerusalem. And, uh, and, and that church has quickly turned into the first mega church, and they just have many, many people. And uh, Peter and, and John, in particular, one day were going to, uh, to, well, to the temple for worship. And uh, long and the short of it is that they, they healed a paralytic, a paralytic who'd been paralyzed for decades, through his whole life. And that caused a very public commotion. And when people began to run to them after the temple service that morning uh, and ask them questions, Peter, as he always did, uh, began to preach and teach the gospel, the good news story of Jesus, that we can have uh, life, that we can have resurrected life through Christ. And that certainly caused some issues with a group of men called the Sadducees. The Sadducees, I would remind you, did not believe in the resurrection. So they were sad, you see. And they, uh, they, they were very distraught when they heard Jesus preaching resurrection. And they actually had, uh, no, excuse me, not Jesus, Peter and John preaching resurrection. And, and, and they actually had Peter and John arrested. And they've gone through a very trumped-up trial at this point. And uh, because there was obvious evidence that God had healed the paralytic through Peter and John, through their, uh, their ministry, they released them. And that's where we pick up in verse 23. So let's read this text. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version of the Bible. I hope you have a physical copy of the Bible in your hands and that you will follow along with me in your copy of God's Word. The Bible says, When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what they the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of your father, of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? Verse 26, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray today that you would grant me that very same boldness to preach your word. I pray, Lord, that you would grant each of us to leave this place and have that very same boldness to preach the gospel 
in our families, in our circles of influence, in our workplaces, and in our friend groups. Lord, that many, many more people would come to know Christ as Lord. Lord, we're going to trust you with the next few minutes and the days and months ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. I read about a woman who had uh, gone to Hobby Lobby. And... Uh, she had found a, a sign there. It was on sale. <laughs> and, and the sign said, Jesus changes lives. So the woman, finding the sign that said, Jesus changes lives, began to picture how that sign could fit in her house. And when she found that sign, the, the, just the perfect spot in her mind for that sign that was on sale to hang in her house, she bought it. She came home, and before her husband could get home, she hung that sign right over the dining room table. And she was so excited, she thought, he's going to love this new sign. And when the man came in from work that day, he walked in, and he looked up at the sign. He didn't say anything, and he just went on to the bedroom. She thought, well, maybe he's just had a hard day, and he had, not you know, not very observant. So she moved on. But she came in about 30 minutes later... And the sign was gone. She began to look around. Why is my sign missing? Jesus changes lives. This is big news. Why is the sign missing? So she began to look around. And she found it behind uh, the hutch over in the dining room. So she pulled the sign back out, hung it back up. The next day she came in, and the sign was gone. So she began to look. She found it under the bed in the, in the master bedroom. So she pulled it back out. She hung it back up. And before you knew it, her and her husband were in one of those unspoken wars. You know what I'm saying? Of course you don't. You're all perfect. Anyway, and so th there's one of these unspoken wars that go on that starts taking place. And she'll hang it up, and he'll take it down, and she'll hang it up, and he'll take it down. And finally, she comes in one day from work, and she just can't stand it anymore. She looks at him. He's over there on the couch. And she said, why don't you like my sign? He said, well, I like the sign just fine. She, she said, what do you mean? You keep moving it. Do you not like the location? Do you want it in a different spot? He said, no, the location's just fine. Then she said, then what is the problem with the message that Jesus changes lives? And the man looked at her and said, listen, I just don't like change. <laughs> Question. When we pray... Who are we expecting to change? See, here in this passage, these believers gather together, and together they lift their voices in prayer. And we have a very detailed prayer uh, from these disciples here. And it's probably not just the twelve. It's probably a whole group of the disciples there from that megachurch in Jerusalem. And they begin to pray. And the question is that when they're praying, hey, when we pray, who is supposed to change? When you pray, who do you want your prayer, or what do you want your prayer to change? Do you want the situation to change? Do you want the other person in your conflict to change? Do you want God to change? Why do we pray? Who is it that we want to change? Matter of fact, we should ask the question, who ought we be looking to change through our prayer? This text is going to address that today. And I know for a lot of us, you're like, hey, I actually hate that word. I'm with the guy in the story. I hate change. Well, let me tell you something. Prayer really does, uh, and Jesus really does change lives, and he does it through prayer. And so we're going to take a look at this prayer from these disciples and how it changed maybe their situation, maybe God, maybe someone else. Let's take a look at the passage. So it says that they were released. See, uh, th th this was a very public commotion that had gone on that Peter and John had caused. And, and they were called into, quite literally, there in Jerusalem, the Jewish equivalent of the Supreme Court. And they were sitting as defendants before the Supreme Court, causing an uprising and, uh, and, and essentially causing a stir there in the capital city of Israel, Jerusalem. And so there was a, a great uproar that had taken place. And if it were not for the fact that God had actually healed this paralyzed man, they would probably be facing capital crimes at this point. They would certainly be still 
sitting in, cha- in jail. But nevertheless, uh, the, the, the Supreme Court there issued this warning, and they released Peter and John. And Peter and John immediately ran back to uh, the, their closest gathering of disciples there in Jerusalem. And it says that they went and, and they reported to their friends what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. The question is, what did the chief priests and the elders say to them? Well, to, to understand that, you have to go back in chapter 4 a little bit. I want you to look up in, in your Bible to chapter 4, verse 18. It says, So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Circle that phrase, in the name of Jesus. They told them, do not go preach, do not go teach, do not share any message, and do not speak to people in the name of Jesus. The question is, what is the problem with the name of Jesus? Well, let me tell you, when, when, these, uh, when Peter and John came back to these disciples and they said that the, the chief priests and the elders, the leading ruling class over Israel, said that we can no longer speak or preach or teach in the name of Jesus, it would have been a great conflict that arose right there in that group. And here's the reason. is because in the first century, to speak in someone's name meant to take on that person's authority and to speak as if you are under and working within that person's authority. So when these religious leaders told the disciples, told Peter and John and all the church to stop speaking in the name, what they were doing was drawing a line in the sand and they were saying that his authority is not excuse me, is not greater than our authority. They were drawing a line in the sand as to say that if you speak in his name, you're going toe-to-toe with the government. You're going to go toe-to-toe with, by the way, the people who in the Old Testament were appointed by God. Not understanding the change and the transition that's taken place on this side of the cross. Lines were, at the, for the first time, formally and officially drawn. And they faced a choice. And you can see the stir that would have broken out in that group when they said, don't speak in the name of Jesus. Some people would have began to say, well, no, I, 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 don't, know that, I, I don't know that we should follow uh, that, that we should follow along with the disciples and keep preaching in the name of Jesus. Other people would have been saying, are you kidding me? Jesus told us to do it. I don't care who says otherwise. We're going to do it. And there would, have been, there would have been these back and forth discussions and arguments saying, no, we shouldn't. We should follow the government's mandate because they said so and they're the ones who are in charge. And over here you have people saying, no, Jesus said so and he's our ultimate authority. We're to follow him. And for the first time, there's really division amongst the church and there's division between the church and the government. There's real-time conflict and persecution on the horizon. And by the way, that is always going to be the case. In a power-driven world, disciples will always face a crisis of obedience, right? You may go years, you may go decades, you might even go centuries without government drawing a formal line in the sand against the church. But at some point, you can take it to the bank. There will be a line drawn in the sand where the government says, you cannot operate under the authority of Jesus Christ or else. And in that moment, the church has to decide. And that's the moment facing these disciples. They are facing a crisis of obedience. Who do we obey? The authority of man or the authority of God? And so look at what they did in response. As this conflict broke out, as the arguments were breaking out, I can just see as one of the apostles stood up and said, Hey, I know rather than you making a decision or you making a decision or me making a decision, why don't we come together and let's seek the face of the Lord? And let's see what saith the Lord, as it were. And so, in verse 24, it says that they heard this command, this warning from the government. And they lifted their voices, circle it, together. Together, they lifted their voices to God. They came together. And by the way, that is how the church operates. That's why in Baptist churches, we are uh, at at our heart congregationalist, right? 
at the end of the day, we, we, we are Christ-ruled, we are pastor-led, we are deacon-served, we're committee-supported, but we are congregationally affirmed. At the end of the day, the last level of, of earthly human authority lies with the local church. Not with your pastor, not with the deacons, not with the government, not with the governor, not with the president, not with the senate or anybody else. The last level of earthly human authority lies with the local church. And so, because there's a corporate decision that has to be made, there's corporate prayer that breaks out. And I want us to take a, a little detailed look as we kind of camp on this prayer for a few moments. A detailed look <clears throat> at what is prayed here. It says they lifted their voices. But I, I love this in verses 24, the second part of 24 down through 30. They, they affirm God's person, who he is, and his power, and his majesty. And then, I love this, they're, they're lifting their voices, but they begin speaking the word of God. So they lift their voices, but they spoke God's word. Let's take a look at this, at this prayer. In verses 24 through 26, it says uh, essentially that they remembered God's provision. It says that they looked up, and the first thing that they do is that they address him as sovereign Lord. Meaning, Lord, Master, Boss, the one who has all authority and all right to do whatever he wants. Because he's sovereign. No one else is above him. No one else holds position above him. Uh, he, there's no other rungs on the ladder, so to speak. He is at the top. He is at the pinnacle. And there is none greater than he. So they say, sovereign Lord. The one who, let's remember his provision, his providing work, made the heaven and the earth. The one who made the sea and everything in them. That very God. They look to this God and they say, God, you are the God who produced everything. And then they go on and, and, and they, rem, they, they, they remind themselves in, essentially of God's word in verse 25. So not only that God produced everything, but that God prophesied through David. Look at 25 uh, and, and following. It says, Who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, by the Holy Spirit said, Why did the, apostle, or did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. What they were doing here was uh, literally directly quoting Psalm 2, 1 through 2. Okay? This is a direct quote from the Psalms. Because as you recall, uh, these, this nation is essentially descended from King David. And he was the first, and uh, not the first, but the, the second, but the first real true king. The first man after God's own heart to lead the nation. And they're referring back to him how he spoke about a certain situation going on in his rule and reign. But then they go on in verse 27 and say, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Let me tell you something. God, not, God prophesied through David about the fact that he was going to provide through Jesus. Just as all the nations, the Gentiles, the Israelites, everybody, formed up against David, the same thing happened to his great, 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 and so on, grandson, Jesus Christ. And so, if you look back in Luke 23, 10 through 12, you can mark that and read it later. You'll see how Herod and Pilate and the Gentiles and the Israelites all gathered together in order to crucify Jesus. But I love this, that he also acknowledges that it wasn't just them, but that God used the evil actions of those people. Look at verse 28. It says that they did whatever God's hand and God's plan had predestined to take place. Let me tell you something. Let me ask you a question. Who is responsible for the crucifixion? That's right. I see people pointing at their wives and <laughs> pointing at their husbands. <laughs> hey, who's responsible for the crucifixion? Well, he says there, he tells us that it was Herod. That it was Pontius Pilate? That it was the Gentiles who drove the nails into Jesus' hand? That it was Israel who brought him on trial and handed him over to the Jewish court, or to the, to the Roman court? By the way, the implication is that he died for our sin. That means that you and I are responsible as well. 
but I love how God can redeem any situation. The darkest, most devastating and destructive moment in human history, when Christ drew that final breath on the cross, but I want you to see who else bears responsibility in it and who planned it from before the foundation of the world. In verse 28, it says that it was God's hand, that it was His plan, that He predestined it to take place. He, the, the Old Testament, we learned that, that it was, he, he was pleased to crush Him. Why? Because that meant redemption for you, and it meant redemption for me. It meant salvation could come to the world, that God could take the worst moment, the darkest moment, the most devastating moment in human history, and use it and turn it into the greatest thing that ever happened for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Don't you realize what it means to sit here today as a redeemed man or woman? That God himself died for you and that Jesus was the one and only Son of God and God the Father crushed him for our iniquity, for yours, for mine. What a beautiful, beautiful reality that we sit in the presence of God today because of him. Not anything that you've done, not anything that I've done, not any good deed or act that the church has done, but because of him and him alone. Yeah, somebody ought to clap about Jesus. I think so. That's good. So they remembered God's provision. But I want you to know something. As they're remembering and recalling the word of God and what God has done for the people and for his church, it's almost like all of a sudden that remembrance of provision turns in verse 29 to a request for provision. He says, now, Lord, this is what you did through David. This is what you did through Jesus. And now because we're his people, now, Lord, look upon their threats. And I love this. He says, I want you to see, God. God, see the threats of the Jewish high court. See what they've commanded us to do. See that they've uh, commanded us to obey their authority and not your own. See that if we obey you, there is great persecution that will sweep across your church. And we will be scattered. We will be devastated. We will be possibly destroyed individually. We might die. If we obey you, I want you to see their threats, and I love this. He does not go on to say, and deliver us from them, does he? Look down at the text. He says, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed, how? Through the name of your holy servant Jesus. I want you to see all of a sudden, in the midst of their prayer, there arises the answer. There arises the solution that we will stick to the name of Jesus and no one else. That it is his name that saved us, his name that redeemed us. It is his name that paved the way from death into life for me and for you. And because of that, we will cling to not the name of Herod, not the name of Pilate, not the name of any governing authority, but to the name of Jesus Christ and him alone. It is his name. And, and look how confident and sure they are in this prayer. They say, Lord, if you will grant us the boldness to preach, if you'll grant us the boldness to continue to speak, then we know what will happen. It says, he says here that you will stretch out your hand. That you will stretch out your hand. That signs and wonders will take place. That people will be healed. And, and there's a confidence about it. It's not the idea that, hey, if we preach, then maybe God might do something. No, he's saying, if you'll preach, I'll be there. <laughs> And they know it. They're sure of it. And so they're confident that, God, if you'll give us the boldness to do it, we know that you'll show up and that you will see people saved, you'll see people redeemed, and you'll see the church continue to grow. And it is all through the name. And when they had finally come to the place where they, together, corporately, were praying, and the answer arose in their midst, what will we do? Whose name will we cling to? We will cling to the name of Jesus. And we will serve through the name of Jesus. And we will speak the name of Jesus. It says in verse 31 that when they had prayed... The place in which they were gathered together was shaken, which in the, first, uh, in, the, in the early church, this was a time when God was visibly working through some things, through, through many, many things. And that was a sign uh, of, his, of his presence. 
in Acts. And you're going to see that theme as we walk through this book over and over, that the place was shaken. That meant that God was there and that he was answering this prayer. And I want you to see what happens. It says that they were all filled. Now notice, he does not say that they were indwelt again. You know that? We were, we were never commanded to receive the Holy Spirit. But we are time and time again in the New Testament commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So you may be a Christian. You may be saved and redeemed. You may be baptized. You may be a member of this church for 40 years. You, you may have your name written under the, under the side of your pew. Right? But at the end of the day, if you don't wake up of a morning and you don't say, Lord... I have nothing to offer you today apart from the working of your spirit in my life. Would you fill me with your spirit so that everything else, every other sin, every other burden, every other hang, out, hang up is cast out of my life. Then, then and only then can you be used effectively for the, gospel, for the advance of the gospel and the growth of the kingdom. So they were again filled with the Holy Spirit. And I want you to see something. When a person is filled with the Holy Spirit, that filling of the Spirit is always accompanied with the speaking of the Word of God. Did you know that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, is married to the Word of God in a sense? You will never hear something from God that you cannot read in that book. And you will never hear something from God that departs from what that book says. Guaranteed. And if you do, you're not hearing from the Holy Spirit. You're hearing maybe from a spirit. You're maybe hearing from, uh, from, from life experience or philosophy from the world or whatever. But at the end of the day, you're not hearing from the Spirit. But here they are. The, the place that they are in is shaken. They are filled. And therefore, they submit. They surrender. And they begin and continue to speak the word of God with boldness. Obeying his authority and no one else. The question posed today is, why do we pray? Let me tell you something. We don't pray to move God we pray so that God might move us. That's the, the, the purpose and the thrust of prayer. That we would come before him and we would say, Lord, the question that I have is, am I in line with you? Does my desire and my want and my will align with your word? And if it does not, the, the request is not, Lord, I pray that you'd change your word. The request is, Lord, would you change me? To walk in that cruciform life that my life would match the word of God. That's how prayer looks. Let me tell you something. I'm, I, this is just flat out the honest truth. The American dream has really ruined a lot of church. <laughs> Our prayers are so selfish and self-centered. I mean, we come before God and we're like, Lord... I'm just... I, I really, you know, I... I, I well, and, and God and I... Um, oh, and Lord, I, I <laughs> it's always, it's I, and it's I, and, and we pray I. The American dream tells us to move God. Let me tell you something. The word of God says that God wants to move you. He wants to move me to realign us and recalibrate us and reorient us around, centered on, driven by his word. So I had the day for you. And for myself, five questions. Five questions to evaluate your prayer life. And they're all from this text. First question Does your prayer life lack fellowship? Does your prayer life lack fellowship? Look at verse 24. What happened when there was great schism that broke out in their church? You've got a, an argument going on over here. You've got an argument going on over here. They're casting stones back and forth. We don't know what to do. This camp says this. This camp says this. This group wants to do that. That group wants to come over here. And they, we've got all this argument and dissension going on. What did they do? Did they scatter and go plant another church because that church is going to help them get along better because it's all their own ideas? No. Let me tell you what they did. It says that they came together. They came together. They said, you want different colored carpet? All right, we'll come together. They said, you want to fight? <laughs> now it's kind of a running joke. About the mint flavor? We'll come together. Orange is the best. Anyway, <laughs> they came together. I want you to circle the word together in verse 24. 
So many times we think because we, we've driven people so much to get a prayer closet and to, and, and to have a war room like in the movie and all this, you know, and those are all good things. You should have a place where you go and it's solitary and it's you and God. You should, if, even if it's not a place, you should have a time strategically throughout your day where you are praying and it's just you and it's God. Let me tell you something though. If we don't have the community, the fellowship of believers, then we're missing out on something. If all I need is a prayer time with God, then I can go sit in a tree stand. And I don't ever have to go to church. I don't ever have to gather with other believers. I could just sit out there. I could read the Bible on, on, my, on my phone, on my Bible app, and I could pray to God. And that would be it. But that's not what we're called to do. They came together. And they lifted their voices together. Corporately. That's why, hey... Everything that happens on a Sunday morning at First Baptist Elk City is strategic. Did you know that? There's a reason that we invite you down every Sunday and give you the opportunity to come down and to gather and to pray with people. I remember times where the local church has done that for me, times where I'm grieving. Uh, one particular time in, 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 uh, that, that comes to mind when my uncle passed away about 12 years ago. I, I just It happened late the night before church. I show up on Sunday morning. I go down and I'm, stand, I'm kneeling at one of the prayer benches just like this. And unprompted, unasked for, a dozen or more people come down knowing what was going on with me and they kneel down beside me, and they put their hand on my back, and they prayed with me. There's something powerful when the people of God come together, and they lift their voices. And by the way, it could be about anything. This last Monday, we're sitting in staff meeting, and we're taking prayer requests. Or maybe it was Thursday. We're taking prayer requests as a staff. And I said, well, you should pray for my keys, and I kind of laughed about it, because as everyone knows, I've lost my church keys at this point. And, uh, and I kind of joked. One of the staff members looked up at me and she said, well, we, could, we could do that. And the reason was she had a whole story about how somebody had, <laughs> prayer had changed the situation, somebody just like that. So we prayed. Still haven't found the keys, by the way, if you want to keep a lookout. But bring anything in prayer. It's okay. It's it's good and encouraged to pray together. And hey, when somebody comes to you, maybe it'll happen today now that we've had this, this time in this text. Maybe it'll happen today where somebody comes to you and they need prayer. You know what you can do? You can grab them by the hand, stop right where you are, in the hallway, at the restaurant, at the grocery store, down at Walmart, wherever you are. Grab them by the hand and say, let's pray. Then you don't become a liar for saying, yeah, I'll pray for you. And then they know that you're right there with them, and God's people are together lifting prayer. Does your prayer life lack fellowship? Question number two, does your prayer life lack scripture? Verses 24 and following, hey, that's what they did, was just pray scripture. <laughs> they literally just looked up and they said, oh, we remember Psalm 2, 1 and 2. And, and so they just called on that. And they, they literally just repeated the word of God that he gave to us back to God. I, I just love that concept. And actually, we as a, as a ministry team, as a staff, every morning uh, since David got on board, David has decided uh, that, that we're going to gather together. I love this concept. Uh, David Platt has, a, uh, has a, a, a podcast kind of thing that he does every morning. It's two to five minutes long where he just gets on, explains a verse real quick, and they pray. He prays that verse. So David started gathering us up as a staff at 10 o'clock every morning. And just for five or ten minutes, we get in there, we pray together, and we pray the Word of God over our day, over the circumstances, over what's coming up for that week, because there's power in praying the Word. And I'm going to tell you something, church. One of the problems that we have in the church today, not just at First Elk City, but the American church specifically, and I'm sure others elsewhere, is that we're praying prayers and we're asking for things that are not promised us in Scripture. The focus of our prayer life is very often things that are not in this Bible, that are not in God's Word. And so we're asking for things. Hey, sometimes we're demanding things that we're not guaranteed. Let me look, look right here at me. You will never have a conviction from God that is not found in God's Word. If you say, I have a conviction for this, there better be a biblical reason for that conviction. Because at the end of the day, then you're just creating, maybe you had a bad taco. You don't know what your conviction is. You know? 
If it's not rooted on something objective, namely the Word of God, then how can you say that it is a conviction? But if you have a conviction, it ought to be rooted in Scripture. There is no conviction without the Word. Does your prayer life lack fellowship? Does your prayer life lack Scripture? Does your prayer life lack mission? If we come to before the Lord and we get on our knees and we pray and say, Lord, I, Lord, me, Lord, I. Let me tell you something. Lord, I is a dangerous thing. But when we get on our faces and we say, Lord, like we did earlier. I know this person who's lost. I know this person who, who, who needs the gospel. Lord, maybe today you might give me an opportunity to advance the gospel into that person's life, to share the story of Jesus, his death, his perfect life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension to the right hand of the Father, and his soon coming back. Maybe you give me the chance to share that gospel story and to see somebody saved or at least plant seeds. Prayer should drive action. So many times we try to separate the two. Like you can act or you can pray. So you have people that say, we spend so much time praying and we need to be out doing. Some, some people say, we, we're, we're not doing, or we're, we're doing so many things, we never spend any time praying. D.L. Moody uh, was, was the founder of the Moody Bible Church and Moody Bible Institute. And one time he was on a, <clears throat> a ship that caught fire. And so they're there at the back of the ship. It's on fire. There's a blaze burning. They're out in the middle of the ocean. And they're thinking, well, what do we do? And so everybody starts grabbing buckets of water from the side of the boat, and they start handing them down to the source of the fire so that somebody can dump the buckets on. And one of the, a young man came up to D.L. Moody, and he said, hey, Brother D.L. Moody, maybe we should go to the back of the boat and, or go to the front of the boat and pray. And D.L. Moody said, no, son, that's not the answer. We're going to stand here and pass buckets and pray real hard the whole time. <laughs> that's the answer. Pray and serve and serve and pray all at the same time. Pray as God is leading you and as God is moving you. And, and, and as he does, surrender to what he puts in front of you. If there's an opportunity to share the gospel, share the gospel. If there's an opportunity to help somebody, help somebody. If there's an opportunity to minister to someone who's in need, pray with that person. Care about that person. Serve other people. Serve the Lord and do so prayerfully the entire time. So often our prayer life lacks the mission that God gave us, namely to make disciples. So does your prayer life lack fellowship? Does your prayer life lack scripture? Maybe you need to pray the Bible. Does your prayer life lack mission? Two more here. Does your prayer life <clears throat> lack the sovereignty of God? Look here. Hey, he says explicitly, explicitly in verse 24, they say, Sovereign Lord. There's an emphasis there that they're coming before the Sovereign Lord, the one who's in control of all things and all circumstances. The one who, I love it how they, how they say it, he's the Sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Do you know what that means? This is the very God who before the foundation of the world, before you and I, ever existed before Adam and Eve had breath, before anything was created. This is the guy who created everything from nothing. This is the, the God who formed the mountains with his hands. Mount Everest brought it up with his own hands. This is the God who reached down and scooped out the seas so that the waters could have a place to gather. This is the God who took the earth. Look here at me. He took the earth and set it on its axis and spun it like a globe. This is that sovereign God. When we pray to him, you don't realize sometimes, we don't realize who we're talking to. So people say, well, I, 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 I just don't know. If God's just going to do whatever he wants anyway, if he's the only one making decisions, then why would I pray? Question is, if God's going to do whatever he wants anyway, why would you not pray? Why, why would we not bring our concerns to him? If he's the only one with the power and the authority and the ability to do anything about it, why not him? I'll tell you something. Sometimes we don't pray because we don't believe in the sovereignty of God. And that's the reality of it. If we're not on our knees regularly, if we're not lifting up our voices regularly, if we're not praying scripture regularly, 
If we're not bringing our concerns and our hurts and lost people and life circumstances to God regularly, it could be because we don't believe that God is as powerful as he says he is. Let me tell you something. If that's you, here, you can hang your hat on the word today. He tells us that he is more powerful. He can do abundantly, exceedingly, above and beyond. When Paul said that in his Ephesian prayer there in chapter 3, you know what that was? That was bad grammar. He didn't even have words to come up with how majestic and powerful God was. So he just started taking words and piling them on top of each other. It's bad grammar. It's good preaching. Right? Because that... That is who God is. There are no English or Greek or Spanish words that can describe the majesty and the power and the authority of God. So when we come before him, remember, you're talking to the sovereign God of the universe who makes blind people see, who makes deaf people hear, who makes lame people walk, and who makes dead men live. Never forget who we're praying to. Never forget who we're praying to. Does your prayer life lack fellowship? Does it lack scripture? Does it lack mission? Does it lack the sovereignty of God. Does your prayer life lack surrender? Does your prayer life lack surrender? Hey, if it does, there could be a reason for that. If we come before the Lord and we pray to Him and we seek His face, but we have no inkling or desire to surrender, Maybe because we don't really, in our heart of hearts, we don't really know about all this. I know he, he says that we'll be out of fellowship with him if I don't surrender to his word and if he's convicting me and I'm not obeying that. Listen, I've heard lost people say things like this. I, I believe in God just enough to make me scared. might be something to that, that we as followers and disciples of Jesus, maybe we ought to believe in God enough that if the lost people are scared by the concept, maybe there ought to be some fear within us, that we believe what he says in this word, that he wants to use us. Do you believe? Do you really believe? I read a story about a, a town in Texas who uh, this new, it had traditionally been a dry county. As soon as they passed the law that it was no longer a dry county, that somebody comes in, they put a bar right down on Main Street. The local church came down to that bar, and they stood outside, uh, outside it on opening day, and they prayed together and asked that God would burn it to the ground. A couple weeks later, lightning hit it. It burned to the ground. The owner of the bar sued the church. The church hired a, however high a profile lawyer a church can buy. And the lawyer came and on behalf of the church argued that the church was not responsible for the bar burning down. And the judge, on the first day of the trial, it said that the judge looked up and he said, Well, I don't know how this is all going to end up, but I do know this. The bar owner believes in prayer and the church doesn't. Hey, what's your prayer life like? Maybe today, maybe, maybe you are, are just like those disciples. Where you're caught in the middle. Maybe Christian, look right here at me. Maybe you're caught in the middle today. Where you're saying, man, it's not governing authority. It's not governmental authority that's coming after me and holding me back. Maybe, maybe it's your own authority that's standing in the way. Maybe you say, I'm the captain of my own ship, and I decide where it goes. Maybe that's you today. And you're saying, I've got my own set of rules that I play by, and the Word of God is not going to interfere with it. Maybe you're stuck in the middle because you're over here, and your heart and your wants and your will and your desire are saying to do this. But over here, the Word of God is saying, no, no, no. Christ is the head of this body. Christ is the one who guides this ship. And God and God alone is sovereign, and He alone has authority over you and everybody else. And you're stuck right in the middle. Hey, if that's you today, Christian, could I beg you? 
you. Hey, on behalf of the lost people out in the world who need to hear the gospel from you and from me, can, can I beg you today that you would surrender to the authority of God over your life? Because at the end of the day, he has authority over your life whether you admit it or not. Why would you trust him with your eternity but not the right now? I don't know that there's a way to do that. <laughs> Christian surrender. Maybe the reason that you come before the Lord and you're just you're praying prayers and you feel like they're just bouncing off the ceiling and they're just these perfunctory prayers. I'm I'm praying that God would bless our dinner and that He would, you know, the old Tim Hawkins thing somehow make this this fast food sandwich the molecular structure would change into something healthy and this kind of thing. Maybe the reason that your prayers are so generic when you come before the Lord. Maybe there's there's cause for that. Maybe it's because you have no intention of surrendering to Him when He convicts you through His Word. Hey, lost person today, you may say, I don't know the Lord. I'm sitting in here for the first time, and you're up there, and you're yelling and sweating, and I, I don't know what's going on. I'll tell you something. You're in the same struggle, but it's a struggle that concerns your eternal soul. Christian can't lose their salvation. They're responsible. They're responsible to, to follow after the Lord. Hey, lost person today, you're stuck in the same struggle your own will, your own authority, or God's. I'll tell you something. Look right here at me. Especially if you don't know the Lord today, listen, listen very closely. It's the most important thing you're going to hear this week. Christ Jesus, 2,000 years ago, lived a perfect life. Something you can't do, something I can't do. He lived perfectly. They killed him according to the predestined plan of God on a cross in Jerusalem. Your sin and my sin deserves death. Jesus did not deserve it, but he willingly took it and poured out his life for you to be your substitute, to take your penalty. So that, look right here at me, listen closely. If you would put your faith in him, if you would pray to him and just say something simple like this, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need a savior. And I need a Lord and Master to show me how to live this life for you. And I believe that that's you. And I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. And if you really mean that, you really will make him Lord and boss of your life. Then, hey, the Bible gives us a promise that you will be forgiven of your sin, all your sin past, all your sin present. You say, oh, but Duncan, you, you don't know what I did even just this morning. Hey, God does. And guess what? He still died for you. All your sin present. And here's the kicker. This is where God is just so majestic, right? Look. All your sin future. When Christ died on the cross, he saw your sin before you existed. He saw my sin before I existed. And he took the nails in his hands and in his feet. He let them drive that crown of thorns down on top of his head. He died the death that Duncan Blackwell deserves. He died the death that you deserve so that you could have freedom. Hey, today, if, if that appeals to you, and I hope it does, if you're tired of being in the war where you're thinking, man, I come to church and I sit through church and they say this, but then on Sunday night through Saturday night, I'm doing what I want over here. If you're tired of that struggle, having to look over your shoulder all the time, having to make sure that your Facebook photos and your Instagram photos don't, don't, uh, don't reveal anything too scandalous about your life, let me tell you something. That's an exhausting life. I pray you'd give it up. Maybe you just need to come before the Lord today and ask him, God, Christian, maybe you ask him, Lord, I'm, I'm I, I, I just walking like a lost person even though I know you. Help me. Convict me. Change me. Surrender your sin to him. Na name your sin before God. Give it to him. A hey, lost man or woman, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something, sir. You will never have the peace that you want and long for so much without Christ. Let me tell you something, ma'am. 
You can walk out these doors and you can go to your car and you can drive home without any assurance or you can walk out of this place knowing that you know you are saved and you are redeemed by the shed blood of Jesus Christ up on the cross at Calvary and you can put your faith in him through prayer today. I'm going to be right down here and I'm going to pray for us. And when I pray, after I finish praying, I'm going to say amen. I'm going to have everyone in the congregation stand, okay? And here's what I want to happen during that time. I want you to have some freedom to come down and pray. If you want to come down to the front and you want to spend some time in prayer, if you want to come down here, you have some questions. Or maybe you just know definitively, yeah, I need Jesus. What I've been doing is not working. The, the effort I've been putting into this whole life thing is just not cutting it. Let me, hey, look right here. Come down here. If you know that you know, hey, grab my hand and I will lead you to Christ today. I can't save you, but I can introduce you to the one who can. His name's Jesus Christ. You come and you be obedient today as the Lord leads you. Don't walk out of here kicking yourself, thinking I should have done something. Don't, don't do that. There's not a person in this room that's going to judge you. It's going to look down on you. And if they do, you send them to me. All right? Because we celebrate salvation around here. We celebrate sanctification around here. When sinners, Christians, saved sinners come and they lay down sin, we glory in that kind of thing because God has been glorified and magnified in that sort of sanctification process. We celebrate that stuff. So you don't let that be a hindrance today. And you don't let your own personal human authority be the hindrance that keeps you from surrendering your life to Christ. You surrender to His authority. You be bold for Him today. Whatever that looks like for you in your personal context. Let me pray for you. Father, we love you and we are so undeserving of your grace. God, we, we do not deserve the fact that Christ came and died on a cross for us. God, we deserve the cross. The very fact that we woke up this morning is just an act of your common grace that you gave us breath to stand. And Lord, I know there may be people in the room today that don't know Christ. God, I pray for them now that you would give them boldness to stand. Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would give somebody in this room who doesn't know Jesus the boldness and the ability to surrender their life to you, that you would embolden them and call them and draw them by the power of your Spirit right now, God. And God, I pray for the Christian in the room who's walking like a lost man or woman. Lord, I pray for that person that they would stop living in this place of turmoil, this place of dissension within their own hearts, trying to follow after their own authority and, and being convicted to follow after yours. God, I pray that you would convict them now and give them the boldness to come and just to lay down that sin before you, confessing it to you, knowing that if they'll confess it before you, that you, you, you are faithful and you are just to cleanse them of all righteousness. God, we praise you for that. I pray that you would give boldness to act this morning. God, we're just going to trust you with the next several moments. I don't know what you'll do here. But God, I'm so thankful that you're using this church and this congregation. I pray that you would continue and that our lives, our prayer lives would look so much more impactful and powerful than maybe what they've been. We trust you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.